Okay, we, we would like to welcome you to a very special session of our Seleucid Lecture Series. We're thrilled to have so many colleagues with us today. My name is Ben Skolnick, and on behalf of my dear friend Altai and myself, we're honored today uh, to present one of the masters of ancient history, Dr. Eric Ruin. Anybody who knows anything about Hellenistic or Roman history or Hellenistic Jewish literature knows everything about Dr. Gruen and his work and titles. Um, I myself am a long time reader and fan of Dr. Gruen, so this is a wonderful moment for me personally. I'm not sure how many books and articles of his I've read, but it's a long list. And there are books on my shelf by him to which I'm constantly referring. So instead of the usual introduction, I just wanna say three quick things. Today, we're gonna to hear a lecture, which is a part of Dr. Gruen's overarching consistent thesis about Rome in the East. When one works in this field, you have to go through his work before making any major or even minor points. Even if one disagrees on a point, his work is so strong and so thoughtfully developed that you have to deal with what he said on the subject. Second point is Dr. Gruen writes in what I call high English. I just made up the phrase. His style is his own and it's elevated and precise. And if you gave me any page of his work, I'd be able to identify it as his. But the third point is what I really want to say. I've, I have been reading his work for years before I had what I call a moment of lightning. It was almost 20 years ago, and I was reading his essay on Hellenism and persecution, and the lights went on, just like when I put on glasses for the first time. I will never forget that moment when I finally understood why Antiochus IV persecuted the Jews. Ever since I was a little boy, I'd been wondering that, and he finally gave me a thesis that I could understand. That was nearly 20 years ago, and it could have been yesterday because it was an intellectually visceral moment for me. If Dr. Gruen had only written that essay, that would have been enough for me to place his work as, as having central importance. So it's a wonderful moment for me to introduce Dr. Eric Gruen. Dr. Gruen. Thank you very much, Ben. <laughs> Uh, after hearing that introduction, I'm not sure that I should go on with this uh, particular presentation. <laughs> possibly match what you just said, uh, including the reference to that article, which I, I still hold to it, although uh, there have been many people who have been unpersuaded by it, and some quite uh, uh, vigorously so. But I do appreciate your uh, introduction very much. Uh, I have often said that one of the that a, a principal reason for giving a presentation or a talk, uh, even though you're very nervous about it, and you're not even sure that it's right, and you wonder about what sort of hostile reactions you might get, nevertheless, hearing one's introduction is always <laughs> makes it worthwhile. So I appreciate that, and I uh, very much. Uh, grateful to you for it, and, and, and to Altai, for both of you, for organizing this session and for bringing a number of people into it, uh, including my responder, uh, Benedict uh, Eckhart, who's, uh, whom I will be, I guess, responding to his response at some point later on today. But let's get on with the show. In the year 161 BCE, Judah Maccabee sent two envoys across the sea to the great city of Rome to seek a pact of friendship and alliance. It was a time when the Roman shadow loomed large over the Eastern Mediterranean. Only a few years earlier, the armies of the Republic had toppled the long-standing and powerful kingdom of Macedon that had traced its roots back to the successors of Alexander the Great. And the climactic battle of Pydna in 168 had settled the fate of the, that once imposing Hellenistic realm. And according to Polybius, Rome was now without a rival in the Mediterranean world and its dominance was secure. So what purpose would then be served? Uh, for the Republic to conclude an alliance with a minor and inconsequential entity in the Levant. Why bother? Now, 
the Jews, for their part, had been um, under the sway of Hellenistic monarchies for more than a century and a half by that time. First the Ptolemies, then the Seleucids. They had had no known contact with the Romans almost throughout that period. So what benefit could they have expected to reap from establishing relations with this distant Colossus uh, at that point? Well, the pact, which is an interest and intriguing phenomenon, has been the subject of a seemingly endless proliferation of books, articles, contentious arguments, reconstructions, speculations, dating back to Momsen and indeed even earlier. I did make a minor contribution to this subject nearly 40 years ago, before many of you who are here were born probably. My contribution did not, of course, even slightly slow down the torrent of studies that have been devoted uh, to this subject or touched upon the subject. Uh, this fascinating connection, its antecedents and its consequences. Now in this short paper, I can't, indeed I don't want to enter into the thickets of scholarly controversies on the details of legal, contractual, or formal aspects of diplomatic exchanges and international relations in the Hellenistic world. Because whatever form the pact between Rome and Judea took is of marginal concern. I wanna ask the larger question, sometimes lost in the shuffle, why did the parties who were so distant and so different from one another why did they enter into this remarkable arrangement in the first place? And what advantages did they expect to get from it? The first book of Maccabees, composed sometime in the later second century BCE, transmits this treaty for us. And the text places the event immediately after the great victory of Judah Maccabee over Nicanor the commander of the army of the Seleucid kingdom, a triumph to be commemorated ever thereafter as the day of Nicanor. That sets it in 161. Now the author of 1 Maccabees then proceeds with what seems to be an excursus. He registers what Judah Maccabee had heard about the Romans and he supplies a lofty encomium of Rome climaxed by an account of the treaty. The treaty concluded between the Western power and the nation of the Jews. And although he delivers this in an ostensible digression, the chronological context is clear enough and there's no good reason to doubt the date. According to 1st Maccabees, Judah sent two representatives to Rome, to friendship and alliance, and to lift, as he puts it, to lift from the Jews the yoke with which the kingdom of the Greeks was imposing slavery upon Israel. The Roman Senate readily adopted the proposal and first Maccabees so, uh, supplies a text of the agreement presented as a copy of a letter which the Romans engraved on bronze tablets and sent to Jerusalem so that the Jews would have a record of their peace and alliance. Now in form, the agreement closely represents other treaties that were framed between Rome and Greek cities in the second century. It constitutes an assertion of mutual military obligations that if either party is attacked by a foe, each promises to supply no military, monetary or material aid to the enemy of the other, but in fact, to bring such assistance to one another when under attack. Now the authenticity of the treaty has from time to time been questioned by skeptical scholars as fraudulent, fabricated, but only by an isolated few and no one has produced any plausible motive for an invention here. 
So I think we can take it as a reasonable replica of the original. But what prompted Judah Maccabee and his supporters to seek alliance with the distant Republic? What benefit could they expect from it? Now, the author of 1st Maccabees maintains that Judah's envoys looked to the treaty as a means of eradicating the yoke of slavery being imposed by the kingdom of the Hellenes. And yet this would hardly be the most obvious occasion for the Jews to lament about Seleucid oppression. Judah had just claimed his most dramatic success in smashing the king's troops, slaying his most prominent general, Nicanor, should have been a time of exaltation, not of lamentation. Yes, it's true that a Seleucid garrison uh, still uh, held the citadel in Jerusalem, but would Judah have had any expectation of Romans crossing the sea to expel Seleucid forces from the tiny principality of Judea. It's hard to imagine that the Jews expected to call upon Roman troops, ships, and material aid in their conflict with the Seleucids. Tiny nation of Judea was barely on Rome's radar screen. I think there was a different motive that prevailed. The value of such a connection for Judah and his followers was surely more symbolic than functional. They could boast now of an association with the greatest power in the Mediterranean and that this would be a daunting prospect for their foes. But which foes? Logical presumption, of course, is that Judah would brandish this alliance with Rome as a means of intimidating the Seleucids. The author of 1st Maccabees at least seems to have thought so. After recording the terms of the treaty, he has the Romans add a coda to it, in which they affirm to the Jews that they have written to King Demetrius about the villainies that he is perpetrating upon the Jews. They, were going to, they had asked Demetrius why he persists in imposing his yoke on the Jews, who are now friends and allies of the Romans. And the Romans promised that if the Jews should make any further complaints, Rome will exercise judgment and make war against Demetrius on land and sea. Such are the words. In fact, however, the Romans did not deliver on that promise, and it's unlikely that anyone expected them literally to do so. Conflicts in Judea were remote from the Roman vantage point. They were also complicated and fluctuating, in fact, more so than is usually understood. It's important to stress here that this was no mere combat between Jews and the Syrian monarchy let alone, as it's sometimes been portrayed, between Hellenism and Judaism. One should note that after Judah Maccabee had recovered the temple in Jerusalem in 164, the Seleucids made no further attempt to seize control of it. In fact, despite common presumption, Jews and Syrians were not locked in a do-or-die struggle. Truces, agreements, negotiations that occurred with frequency, even in the time of Antiochus IV, the persecutor. And even he had lo largely lost interest uh, in, the, in Judea in his final months. The letter of the boy king who succeeded him, Antiochus V, reinforced by a letter of his minister Lysias, recorded in 2nd Maccabees, they affirmed restoration of the temple, guaranteed that Jews could continue to govern themselves in accordance with the customs of their forefathers. 
Now this didn't, of course, prevent further warfare. But in subsequent years, hostilities between Jews and Seleucid forces were frequently suspended, agreements were concluded, amity was restored, even if temporarily. It was no zero sum game. In 162, the young king Antiochus V came to terms with the Jews, concluded a peace agreement, and according to 2nd Maccabee, swore an oath to honor all Jewish rights and privileges. He even gave a warm welcome to Judah Maccabee himself. Yes, to be sure, the truce broke down shortly thereafter, as it often did. Hostilities recommenced. But a principle of negotiation had been established to be revived whenever it seemed of benefit to both Seleucids and Hasmoneans. When Demetrius I took the Syrian throne in 162-1, he appointed Nicanor, new general, to take command of the forces in Judea. And after an initial encounter with the Maccabean troops, the Seleucid commander, interestingly, immediately sent envoys out to seek Judah and he received a generous reception. He concluded an amicable agreement. And if 2nd Maccabees is to be believed, he even established a personal relationship, culminating in friendly advice to Judah to settle down and start a family. Advice which the Jewish leader duly, uh, which he duly complied. Now this arrangement also fell apart though it was not the doing of Nicanor, but it reinforces the notion that the contest between Seleucids and Maccabees did not involve an organic or an irrevocable enmity. These negotiations, in fact, heralded a long series of diplomatic engagements and mutually beneficial pacts between the Hasmoneans and Seleucid kings or pretenders or rivals uh, over a period of the next half century or, or more. The successors of Judah indeed relied, at least in part, relied for their political ascendancy upon the approbation and the official backing by claimants upon the Syrian throne. The history of the Maccabean era does not resolve itself into a clash between Greek and Jew. What requires emphasis here, and has in, to my mind received inadequate attention, is that Judah Maccabees' enemies were by no means limited to the forces and garrisons of the Hellenistic monarchy. His was a new family, striving to gain preeminence within Judea, and more broadly in Palestine, and to that end, Judah fashioned his own persona as a champion of Israelite tradition and as a revival of its biblical past. The foes whom Judah targeted in his military operations were largely those who recalled the ancient adversaries of Israel, the peoples of Palestine and Transjordan against whom the biblical heroes had conducted their campaigns. So, for example, Judah marched to the south proclaiming that his attacks were leveled at the sons of Esau. And he then took on the Ammonites. Now, the author of 1 Maccabees referred to these peoples collectively as Ta Ethne, the nations, or Ta Ethne Ta Kuklo, the encircling a, a nations. The successes of, of Judah echoed victories over Canaanites. Ammonites, Edomites, and Philistines. And it's quite striking that in referring to all of these peoples, the author of 1st Maccabees never applies the designation of Hellenes. Those who fought against Judah and his brothers were regularly rendered as lawless and impious, as Anomoi and Asabes usually with reference to other Jews who are hostile to the Maccabees. It's the domestic quarrel 
that gains repeated notice. It may be most readily exemplified by the figure of Alchemist, the high priest. Alchemist was appointed to that post evidently in 162. And after Demetrius I took the throne of Syria, Alchemist went to him with gifts, including a golden crown and sought assistance against the Maccabean forces. He represented them to Demetrius, of course, as rebels against the Seleucid regime. But he adds his own personal grievance as having been deprived of his high priesthood. In other words, an internal contest lies at the heart of this uh, situation. The king duly sent troops to Judea, first under Bacchides, then under Nicanor. But as the author of 1st Maccabees makes clear, Alchemus was a central player here, determined to thwart the leadership of Judah and his family. The fierce hostility towards Alchemus that is displayed by the author of 1st Maccabees, who is of course a firm proponent of the Hasmoneans. This hostility to Alchemus makes that situation abundantly clear. The text introduces Alchemus as leader of the lawless and impious from Israel. Same terms that were flung about consistently when referring to the internal enemies of Judah Maccabee. Alchemus's appeal to the new Syrian ruler Demetrius and his denunciation of the Maccabees came according to the author in the very context of his desire to secure confirmation of his position as high priest. Civil strife within Judea came vividly and fatally to the fore shortly thereafter, when the Hasidioi, the pious ones, came to seek favors from Alchemus and to show the, their support for him as an Aaronite priest and to the Seleucid commander Bacchides, whose troops accompanied him. Now, Alchemus at first professed to welcome the Hasidioi, but then had them arrested and executed 60 of them on the spot. Now, just what lay behind this stunning episode uh, remains quite obscure. But the actions of Alchemus was plainly designed to overawe his enemies within Judea, a consequence that was explicitly stated by the text. Now, to be sure, Alchemus had the backing of the Seleucid officialdom, but the people who flocked to him were Jews, adversaries of the Maccabees, people whom the text of 1st Maccabees labeled as disruptors and whom Judah denounced as having caused far worse damage even than Ta Ethne had done in the past. The distinction here between Ta Ethne and the dis so-called disruptors is unequivocal. That is, the principal miscreants were the Jewish opponents of the Maccabees, or so represented. The subsequent encounter between Judah and the new Seleucid commander Nicanor, as I've already mentioned, produced a friendly parley between the two generals. Now that, of course, was against the interests of Alchemus. And when Nicanor and Judah reached an amicable accord, the high priest acquired a copy of their pact and rushed to King Demetrius to denounce that pact and to insist that Nicanor should arrest the Maccabean, have him sent in chains to Antioch. Now, Nicanor did not comply with that request, but Alchemus's intervention did succeed in putting an end to any negotiations and hostilities resumed. The maneuvers of Alchemus are a key element in this story. And the whole narrative signals profound civil strife within the Jewish communities of Palestine. So that by contrast with what uh, was really an on again, off again uh, contest with the Syrian empire, Judah Maccabee had on his hands repeated friction, rivalry, contention for power among his own people. 
And that feature, quite prominent in the evidence, but conventionally downplayed in the scholarship, that provides a vital context, in my view, for Judah's turn to Rome and acquisition of a treaty of alliance. It's well to remember, as I've mentioned before, that Judah sent envoys to Rome shortly after gaining his most decisive victory, the defeat and death of Nicanor, and then a grand public celebration of Maccabean might. Judah's representatives arrived in Rome at a high point in their leader's career, at a time when he could exhibit a position of strength at home. Now, the sec it's interesting that the second book of Maccabees ends its account at the time of Judah's triumph, a moment of signal glory. Its author had not bothered to record an appeal to Rome at this point. That might have taken, if he'd done it, might have taken the spotlight off the, his hero's accomplishments at home. Now, the military achievement proved to be temporary. Seleucid army had indeed been humiliated, but the Jewish enemies of the Maccabees were undiminished. The king soon marshaled another force, much larger than before under Bacchides, and in the ensuing battle, Judah's troops were overmatched and their leader fell. Now, what part, if any, Jewish fighters play, play uh, in support of uh, the Seleucid battalions, we don't know. But we are told that after the death of Judah, the Anomoi and the perpetrators of injustice, as they're called, resurged in all the regions of Israel. And Bacchides, the Seleucid overseer in Palestine, chose these impious to be in charge of the land. They duly sought out the friends of Judah, we're told, and brought them to Bacchides for punishment where they were derided and punished. As is clear, the internal struggle for power remained an element of key significance. So when Judah solicited a treaty with Rome, he surely did not imagine that the Western power would send troops, ships, materiel across the seas for his war against the Seleucids, and certainly not for his contest for ascendancy against internal rivals. But the treaty did have significant intangible force. Coming as it did on the heels of a smashing military win, it would signify the Maccabean ascent to a level of esteem on the international front, an esteem that was acknowledged by the preeminent power in the Mediterranean world. That was no small matter, and it was not mere tokenism. We have direct testimony that a conspicuous linkage with Rome could boost the image of the Maccabees with dramatic force. It was two decades later when Judah's brother Simon became high priest and renewed the pact with Rome. The Seleucid ruler at that time, Demetrius II, having learned of this, immediately uh, confirmed Simon's high priesthood and showered excessive honors upon him. The Romans indeed, at this point, took the trouble even to announce the renewal of the alliance by sending messages not only to Demetrius, but to a whole host of Greek princes, states, and cities throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. Now to wave a Roman alliance as a flag in the face of the Seleucids would have little practical effect on the battlefield. The Hellenistic kingdom did not anticipate any overseas resistance to the maintenance of its position in Judea. Intermittent fighting and, negoti and negotiations back and forth marked the Seleucid relations with the Jews and kept the Seleucid footprint firmly in the land. A Maccabean pact with a distant Westerner did not curb the ambitions 
of the ruling power in Antioch. But the startling rise in stature for the house of the Maccabees, now a confirmed partner with the Colossus of the West, this would meaningfully augment their eminence on the domestic front. The impression delivered to their Jewish adversaries could have a more imposing effect. The family of Judah and his brothers, relative newcomers to the Judean scene, now possessed an emblem of overseas prestige that could discourage adversaries at home. The internal domestic scene needs to receive more attention as a backdrop to the Roman Jewish treaty than it has received. It was not a matter solely of international relations. The agreement was more a showpiece than a piece of foreign policy. Well, let me turn now to the Romans and to their perspective. Their motives for entering into such a compact are far from obvious. What would they get out of it? After the victory at Pydna in 168, the Rome's, uh, Roman ascendancy in the Mediterranean world could hardly be questioned. To frame an alliance with a minor state of small consequence in the East and almost unknown in the West, it had no obvious advantages. Why do it? Well, the usual answer seems logical enough on the face of it. The Romans had their eye on Syria. The Jews could serve them as a check on the ambitions of the Seleucid monarchy. Well, the contemporary historian, Polybius, lends some support to that interpretation. And as we all remember, a Roman legate had, after all, arrived in Egypt shortly after the Battle of Pydna it had brusquely ordered Antiochus IV to pull his forces out of Egypt and to go back home. And Polybius consistently uh, ascribes cynical motives to the Roman Senate in its dealings with foreign powers in this period, including Syria. In his view, the Romans held the Seleucid prince Demetrius as a hostage because it suited their interests evidently to exercise some leverage over affairs in Syria. And they then dispatched an embassy to the region in 163 that proceeded to burn the Seleucid fleet, to disable their elephants, and generally to weaken the royal power, says Polybius. Now there's no mention by Polybius of the Jews. He provides no record of the treaty. I don't want to make too much of that because Polybius' text is quite fragmentary for this period and he may have mentioned it in portions that we don't have. But we do know that Demetrius remained under surveillance in Rome for a time, perhaps to allow matters to settle down in Syria after the death of Antiochus IV. But Demetrius escaped anyway. He headed home in 162 or 161 to claim his throne probably with the contrivance of some prominent Romans. But the Roman Senate took no further action. And Demetrius could even claim to his countrymen that he came with Rome's blessing. He proceeded to execute the young king Antiochus V and took charge of the realm as Demetrius I. Now the idea that a Roman pact with the nation of the Jews would serve to intimidate the Seleucid monarchy is an idea that is hard to swallow. The treaty itself did provide for reciprocal military obligations. But Judah Maccabee surely did not imagine that Roman forces would actually land in his homeland, expel Seleucid hegemony. And of course, the prospect of Jewish armies and ships coming to the aid of Rome in its wars against its enemies is of course too absurd even to contemplate. The treaty was an amicable gesture, a symbolic signal of friendship, with no expectation on either side of its actual implementation. The Romans showed no signs of seeking to bully the Seleucids at this time. 
because they certainly had opportunities to do so if they wished. I'll give you a couple of examples to make this point. Timarchus, the satrap of Media, broke off from Seleucid rule, laid claim to an independent kingship in Media, and sought support in Rome, allegedly through lavish distributions of cash. But all that he got for it was a bland statement from the Roman Senate acknowledging his rule. They promised no material aid and they never gave any. Timarchus recruited forces, made an alliance with the king of Armenia, mounted assault on the realm of, and of Demetrius, but failed miserably and paid with his life. Roman help was nowhere in sight. The other example is even more striking and memorable and very challenging for interpreters. And while Demetrius was still in Rome and the boy king Antiochus V sat on the Seleucid throne in 163, Rome sent a delegation, I've alluded to this before, sent a delegation headed by a certain Aeneas Octavius. Mission sent to the east, which called in at Syria, but also at many other places. But in Syria, this mission of Octavius exercised authority in seemingly unequivocal terms. The instructions, on, on the instructions of the Senate, according to Philippians, Octavius and his colleagues ordered the destruction of the Seleucid fleet, the hamstringing of the elephants, thereby to undermine the royal power in Syria. Now this shocking event triggered a dramatic response. Indignation and rage in Syria had resulted in the death of Octavius at the hands of an assassin, Leptines of Laodicea. Stunning though that episode must have been, the sequel was still more astonishing and I think quite revealing, for it failed to bring about any Roman retaliation. On the contrary, Lysias, who was the guardian and regent for young Antiochus V at that time, Lysias, who was anxious about potential consequences, sent delegates to Rome to deny any involvement by the king or his friends in the murder of Octavius. Well, they received a stony silence from the Roman Senate. But the Senate refrained from any pronouncement or any expression of opinion on the subject. The assassin, Leptines, seems to have seen the matter quite clearly. He didn't shrink from responsibility for the deed. Indeed, he openly boasted of it. He took full credit for it. When Demetrius ascended to power, Leptines offered to go to Rome himself and fully justify the act before the Senate. Now Demetrius had only just recently escaped from Rome and was newly enthroned, certainly happy to comply with Leptines' request. He sent a magnificent, a very expensive crown of gold pieces to Rome together with Leptines, the assassin himself. He could probably have saved himself the expense because Leptines suffered no punitive measures. <clears throat> Actually, there's no punitive measures. And the Senate's response to Demetrius was cool, but affirmative. They said if he exercises his power in a manner satisfactory to the Senate, he will enjoy his generosity. The murder of Octavius went entirely unpunished. Now, how to account for this is much debated. There isn't any easy answer. But one can say at least this much, I think, that if Octavius's harsh and brutal actions in Syria had actually been carrying out considered senatorial policy, the forbearance of Rome with regard to his murder would be quite inexplicable. The fact is, that Octavius' drastic deeds did not conform to normal Roman practices in the East. Quite the contrary. The hands-off attitude, 
that had prevailed in Rome in the cases of Antiochus V and of Demetrius and of Timarchus and even of the assassin of a Roman legate, the tokens of reluctance to become entangled in or committed to overseas obligations that the Romans didn't want. And in view of that attitude, the thesis that's propagated by Polybius and adopted by many modern scholars, that is that Rome meddled in the East in order to cripple the regime in Antioch, simply doesn't meet the facts. Treaty with the Jews, in short, cannot reasonably be seen as part of a larger policy to dismantle or debilitate the Seleucid Empire. Indeed, this episode requires us to reconsider an even more basic conception, a conception that underlies almost all discussions of this subject, and that is the very notion of a Roman foreign policy. We assume they must have had one. Certainly they maintained a close watch on events that took place abroad. They received numerous requests to intervene, to arbitrate, to pass judgment on disputes, to exercise authority on matters of international conflict. Indeed, the Roman Senate appointed numerous embassies, sometimes several in a year, to investigate matters in the Eastern Mediterranean that have been brought to their attention. So one would imagine that through such missions, Rome had built up a diplomatic corps, a collection of knowledgeable individuals with experience overseas, and with expertise in the lands and peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean. People who could then guide the Republic's policy and frame a consistent stance on its relations with Hellenistic monarchs and leagues and city-states and principalities. That would seem perfectly reasonable. And yet that is precisely what Rome did not do. Yes, there was a blizzard of missions abroad in the second century, but a careful scrutiny of the personnel on those missions reveals something quite striking. And I think quite surprising, maybe, to some. But despite the very large number of diplomatic legations, it was rare for the same person to be on more than one such mission, and rarer still for him to go back to the same place more than once. Yes, there were some exceptions. Given the flurry of embassies, some repeat performances were inevitable since almost all of the delegates came from the elite and were members of the senatorial class. There simply weren't enough senators to go around to provide entirely new personnel every time. Yet when there are multiple services by the same person, there's no obvious connection among the places that he visited or the purposes that he fulfilled. Now, this is indeed quite remarkable. The appointments to these delegations depended largely on the political prestige and the authority of the individuals, not on any special knowledge of the people or places to which he was going. The appointees almost never carried messages that reflected official policy. They were largely on their own. Even men of considerable eminence often returned home after one of these missions, returned home with recommendations, recommendations that were entirely ignored or overtly rejected by their colleagues in the Senate. Even the cases of those who went on more than one mission, and it's very rare that anybody went on more than two, even those form no pattern or consistency in the locations to which they were sent or the reports that they brought back. Assignments differed in time, place, and character. The ad hoc nature of what we might probably and wrongly call diplomacy, that ad hoc nature stands out with clarity. Now, it would be pointless for me to survey all the evidence on Roman officials who traveled abroad 
on public commissions in the second century, but the fact is that the vast majority went for just one trip. A few went twice, only a tiny number went more often. And those who did rarely returned to the same location and almost never for the same purpose or even a similar one. So what do we infer from that? It seems as clear as can be that Rome consciously avoided the development of a body of experts, of a skilled and experienced group of diplomats who were deeply familiar with overseas nations and leaders. They had nothing resembling a state department or a foreign office. They didn't station representatives abroad. They didn't set up offices for foreign area specialists at home. They didn't have committees of the Senate that dealt with matters of foreign relations. The senatorial class as a whole, it seems, didn't want to be dependent upon a particular set of informed specialists who would then determine or at least shape the judgment of the collective assembly. The collectivity counted, the corporate identity of the Senate that discouraged the promotion of professionalism by, a, by any segment within its body. And as a result, and I think quite deliberately so, there could be no overall or coherent foreign policy. In the light of all this, the extremely puzzling episode that involved the assassination of the Roman legate Octavius in Syria, and the confidence of his assassin that he could come to Rome, boast of his deed and escape punishment, it's perhaps not so puzzling after all. Octavius was not carrying out any considered or sustained senatorial policy. And his death did not derail any long-term Roman interests in the area, such as they were. Ad hoc decisions were the rule rather than the exception. In the absence of consistency in Roman attitudes towards overseas affairs, is no better illustrated than by one of the Republic's most eminent orators and statesmen, Cato the Elder. In 167, after Rome's defeat of Perseus in the Macedonian monarchy, and its dismantling of that uh, monarchy, many Romans took a dim view of Greek states that had supported Macedon or had sympathized with Perseus. Among them was the island of Rhodes, which had formerly been a close friend and ally of Rome. But during the war with Perseus, the Rhodians had attempted to negotiate a peace between the warring partners. Now to the Romans, after their victory at Pydna, any efforts at peace seemed less a pacific move than an effort to rescue Perseus from Roman retaliation. And there was a strong contingent in the Roman Senate that now pressed for armed hostilities against Rhodes, which would be a gross mismatch if it occurred. Well, Cato rose in the Senate to give a ringing speech to spare Rhodes. And his principal argument was quite compelling. The warmongers in the Senate, he said, had no case to make because Rhodes had taken no action against the Romans. The most they could say was that Rhodes wanted to go to war, but had not yet done so. And they should be crushed so that they couldn't fulfill that supposed wish. In short, the proponents of war on Rhodes wanted a preventive war. Well, Cato pronounced his opposition to this with uh, cutting rhetoric. The worst accusation they can make, he said, against the Rhodians, is that they wished to be our enemies. Well, which of you, pray tell, would consider it fair to be punished just for wishing to do wrong? If it isn't fair for somebody to be honored for simply wanting to act nobly, but failing to do so, why should Rhodians suffer for simply wanting to act ignobly, but declining, in fact, to do so? Well, Cato's argument 
was unanswerable. And the Senate dropped the idea of declaring war on Rhodes. But in a far more famous case, two decades later, when Rome was contemplating war on Carthage, the same Cato notoriously took exactly the opposite line. That those who rejected, excuse me, rejected an assault on Carthage had claimed quite reasonably that the Carthaginians had initiated no aggression against their neighbors, had certainly not taken any overt steps to menace or challenge Rome. And Cato's reply to that objection is notable. He stated that overt acts are not necessary to justify war. The Carthaginians, he said, are our enemies and whoever makes preparations against me so that he can bring war whenever he wishes is already my enemy, even if he hasn't taken up arms. In other words, Cato quite unambiguously advocates preemptive war. Strike before they strike you. Never mind that the Carthaginians have engaged in no hostile acts. It's what they might do that matters. And that, of course, is the line with which Cato is uh, forever famous or notorious. It is said that he closed every speech that he gave in the Senate, no matter what the subject of the speech was, he closed it with the ringing words, gentlemen, Carthage must be destroyed. Everybody remembers that. What's forgotten, however, is that when he had spoken up against a war on Rhodes, he had taken exactly the reverse position. And yet no one to our knowledge ever accused Cato of inconsistency on such matters. Unpredictability was a conspicuous feature of Rome's approach to what we conventionally consider to be foreign policy. And one can easily cite examples of comparable inconsistency by many other spokesmen and statesmen. Well, it's important to ponder the consequences of this. It's the very spasmodic character of Rome's behavior abroad and its repercussions in domestic debate stem directly from the structure of its upper class society, the corporate attitudes of its aristocracy, the aversion to professionalism, the discouragement of a diplomatic establishment, help to explain the absence of long range planning and the often inconsistent pronouncements and decisions. Well, if we turn finally, once again, to the pact between Rome and Judea, seen in this light, certain conclusions would seem to follow. The, agreements, the agreement should not be seen as a check on the ambitions of the Seleucid monarchy let alone as part of some larger framework of Roman policy in the East. Like so much else, it was an ad hoc decision with little concern for long-term implications. The Senate did not expect or even imagine that Roman armies would be sent across the seas to support the ambitions or serve the interests of Judah Maccabee and his family. Why then agree to the treaty? Well, one might properly respond by asking, why not? It would be a gesture of goodwill. It would cost Rome nothing. And it would emblematize the Republic's prestige and aura that now extended well into the Near East. It's well to remember that we have record, mostly epigraphic record, of several other pacts of Philia Caesimachia in the second century between Rome and various Eastern cities like Maranea, Astipalea, Kibera, Methymna, each of which, each of these treaties contain clauses prescribing reciprocal military obligations closely comparable to those in the Jewish treaty. Now those cities were of course all minor insignificant entities in the larger Mediterranean picture. Rome certainly had no intention of assigning troops 
or resources to those principalities any more than they did to Judea. And the idea that such cities would come to the aid of Rome in its Western wars and expansion is of course quite ludicrous. Plainly these compacts were courtesies, formalities, announcements of amicability, an advertisement of Roman favor and esteem across the waters. And the treaty with the Jews falls very neatly into that category. It is precisely the intangible nature of such a compact. It's suggestive implications for the prestige of the House of the Maccabees on the one hand, and a display of the long reach of Roman influence on the other that gave it appeal to both parties. That went beyond mere formalities. It carried meaning for the self-esteem of each party. It was in a sense both less than and more than a military alliance. It was neither an effort by the Jews to intimidate the Seleucid kingdom, nor was it part of a calculated Roman foreign policy. But the symbolism mattered. At a time, um, as Polybius observed, the Orcumene was linked together as never before. The Jews wished to claim a part on that larger stage. And the Romans took the opportunity to exhibit their preeminence on that stage. This form of international relations was less a matter of policy or strategy than of exhibition and vanity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this inspiring and compelling presentation, dear Eric. Um, and I withhold from any further comments now because the privilege to giving a response is not mine, but uh, Dr. Benedict, Benedict Eckhart, uh, whom I have uh, the honor to introduce to this audience. Uh, Benedict comes to us as a lecturer from the, the University of Edinburgh, which he joined in 2018 only a couple of years after gaining his PhD in Bochum in uh, 2011. And in between, he held postdoctoral appointments at Münster University and Bremen University. So when we look at the timeline, uh, Benedict is just someone who we might still call an emerging scholar, someone turning from junior uh, to the middle field. But when we look at his list of publication, uh, I think it is the envy of most professors when they reach their age of retirement. Um, the last, uh, well, from 2011 to uh, 2021, 22, on average, at least one book authored, edited, co-authored or co-edited, besides a very high number of, um, of articles, dozens of peer-reviewed articles and they have seriously left a very strong imprint on our field of especially Jewish and Judean history in the Hellenistic and Roman periods in very many different sub areas. I started engaging with his work when I gradually shifted my interest from the Seleucid Kingdom and Roman foreign policy towards Judea as an excellent subfield of study and uh, being interested in uh, dynastic representation and the development of ethnic identity, Benedict's work, uh, monograph from 2013, Ethnos, uh, Ethno, Ethnos und Identität, was one of the first um, books I, I read and I spent a long time with it, also considering the many lengthy notes, but what he presents there is so typical and representative of his very thorough scholarship, which engages, engages so deeply with a vast amount of modern scholarship in so many languages, as much as in uh, with the ancient sources, again, in so many languages. So we have invited him, especially for his skills, but for his shown ability to engage with other people's opinion, which have, has also uh, enriched my own 
research in recent, in recent years. So uh, I'm very, very grateful together with Ben that you, Benedict, has, have accepted our invitation to respond to Dr. Gruen's presentation. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much, Altai. Uh, I think you've just spent more time on the uh, introduction than you have actually given me for the response, uh, because you gave me only five minutes. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, thank you nevertheless. Um, uh, thank you, Eric, as well, for your paper. I think six years ago, uh, you were responding to one of my papers. And I remember it being a very nice occasion, but uh, in the end, your very nice response basically meant don't we know this already and uh, what is this good for? So uh, I, I, I can't do this to you, unfortunately, because I didn't know already uh, what you were going to tell us today. Uh, I mean, I did because you sent me the paper, but I didn't know the, um, the result before. So uh, I shall just start by uh, saying uh, that I actually have little of substance to add to what Eric just said, in part because I was given this grand total of five minutes, uh, but also because I actually have much sympathy for an approach that does not get entangled in the formalities of this treaty. Uh, my second supervisor in that PhD was Jörg Dieter Gauger, who only did formalities, um, but who actually focuses on its communicative dimensions and its use as a symbol with different meanings, perhaps, uh, depending on uh, the perspective of the different participants. I share Eric's fascination with underlying subtleties and less obvious interpretations that let seemingly straightforward facts appear in a new light. The question, of course, is always how far we can push this approach. And this brings me to the first part of my response, which deals with the Roman side, where Eric just concluded. We can grant, I think, most of Eric's arguments, perhaps all of them, in principle. The lack of personal continuity, the lack of consistent strategic planning, the lack, in short, of the consistent foreign policy one might expect of an empire. But this only shows that strategic thinking was not consistently developed over decades. It does not show that it was absent in any individual moment that led to a treaty. Eric mentions several contemporary treaties with smaller partners, like Maroneia, Astupalaya, and Kibura. And few will disagree with the statement that, I quote, the idea that such cities would come to the aid of Rome in its Western wars and expansion is quite ludicrous. But take the case of Maroneia, which got, it, got its treaty very soon after the Battle of Pytna. The city had fought against Rome in the Third Macedonian War, after which Attalus of Pergamon asked for it as a price for his own efforts. Rome declared the city free instead and concluded a treaty. Polybius admittedly makes the Senate's deliberations on this look rather chaotic, but the strategic position of the Thracian coastal cities will not have been lost on decision makers. Yes, Maroneia would not help in Western wars, but it could help to control a region that was notoriously unpredictable. And it could also buy time in any future invasion from the East, as it did admittedly without much consequences against Mithridates later. What is more, the relationship with Pergamon under Eumenes II was not set in stone. And having an allied city close to the Attalid sphere of influence could create convenient justifications for later wars and perhaps the regime change that Rome had toyed with before. Should we really deny the strategic interests involved in a treaty like this? And can we really claim with confidence that there wasn't the slightest chance that it might matter for military engagement? The Judean Treaty, I think, can be understood in similar ways. In 161, Demetrius had only recently left Rome against the will of the Senate. The delegation of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus had called him king, but it is unclear if the Senate ever confirmed this. When Judas's envoys arrived, no one could know how the situation would develop. I do think that the reply to Timachos, that he could be king if he wanted to, suggests that Rome, Roman senators were working against Demetrius whenever the opportunity arose. That Ariarates V had the delegation come to Rome early in 160 to declare that none of his earlier arrangements with Demetrius were still in place shows that others were well aware of Roman doubts and adjusted their politics accordingly. The idea that Rome would actually send troops was hardly perceived as totally absurd. And had they ever done so, the Judeans would have been obliged to give support. Sanchez, in my view, has it right when he argues that the treaty gave the Romans a possible reason to interfere, 
and some valuable military support on the ground, if, that is, they decided to move against Demetrius. That they did not do so in the end confirms Eric's wider view on Roman foreign policy, but precisely because that view is convincing, we should not assume that this result was predictable in 161. Eric, you have pointed out the unpredictability of these decisions. So I don't think that you can say that Judas definitely knew that nothing would ever happen. As is so often the case, I think, with Eric's papers, he presents us with a situation where no one really meant what they seemed to be saying explicitly. Instead, it all comes down to matters of representation, of how the respective parties of an exchange want to imagine themselves and be seen by others. Of course, that is important. And Eric alerts us to aspects that the many legalistic discussions of the treaty usually fail to take into account. But it is always possible that people quite simply do mean what they say. And it is usually rather difficult to conclusively prove that they don't. In this particular case, we are dealing not just with the text. Quite a lot of effort went into this, not least ceremonially, with the invocation of Fides and possibly the display of a bronze tablet in Rome. All this just for a symbol. Eric is surely right that the symbolic aspect must have played a part, but I would still hold on to the view that the Romans had a bit more in mind than just an abstract conception of the spread of their hegemony. The other half, the first half of Eric's paper deals with a Judean perspective, where I am actually more competent. And here I very much agree with the view that having negotiated a treaty with Rome would have been a great asset for local elites and those who wanted to achieve that status. That the Hasmoneans used it in precisely this way is demonstrated, as Eric points out, although he reads it slightly differently, by the very fact that we know about it. The reason for including the treaty and its later renewals under Jonathan and Simon in the first book of Maccabees can only be that the Hasmonean court writer who produced the book wanted to showcase this aspect of Hasmonean prowess. Nor was this the first time Rome was used as an argument for the legitimization of Hasmonean rule. The Simon decree of 140, a few decades before 1st Maccabees was written, although of course Altai disagrees, also brings up the friendship with Rome and even claims that Demetrius II had recognized Simon as high priest because of it. As Hasmonean power was gradually established in Judea against significant opposition, the Roman trump card was played more than once. And this also explains the presence of the Laus Romanorum in our chapter eight. It has of course frequently been recognized that the praise of Rome presupposes the results of the Achaean war and cannot therefore be what Judas heard in 161, as 8.1 claims. All that is true, but it is first and foremost an explanation, in my view, of the material that we have, which is a later Hasmonean elaboration. When applying this logic to the time of the actual events, we may need to take into account some other factors. To develop this point, I would pick up on a detail in Eric's text, he notes that the second book of Maccabees ends with Judah's victory over Nicanor just before the embassy to Rome. According to Eric, its author had not bothered to record an appeal to Rome. That might have taken the spotlight off his hero's accomplishments at home. Perhaps. But of course, as Eric knows full well, the book does mention the embassy at an earlier point. In chapter 4 of Second Maccabees, Jason's establishment of a gymnasium is described much moral indignation there, but also a constitutional argument. I quote, Jason set aside the existing royal concessions to the Judeans, secured through John, the father of Abolimus, who went on the mission to establish friendship and alliance with the Romans. We have every reason to believe that the constitutional point made here is wrong, but what matters is something else. John had presumably negotiated with Antiochus III in the name of Simon II, and his son, Eupolemus, was later sent to Rome in the name of Judas, but we wouldn't know that from the text. At least on this occasion, what is committed to memory is not the achievements of state leaders, not the achievements of Judas, but the exploits of one Judean elite family that must have been politically well connected. John and Eupolemus are heroes in their own right, not tied to the names of any ruler of their time. There must have been a tradition of celebrating successful delegations to the great powers well before Judas, and it would appear that this tradition was limited to a relatively small Judean elite. Uriel Rappaport has helpfully listed the delegates known from the Maccabean books and Josephus. There are some we cannot place, but we clearly see intergenerational connections and an altogether limited number of families that had the necessary expertise. Apart from the family of Akos, 
to which the father's son, Pierre John, and Apollomos belonged, the family of Eleazar is particularly prominent. Judas sends Jason, son of Eleazar, Jonathan and Simon both sent Antipater, son of Jason, and John Hyrcanus sends Alexander and Diodorus, both sons of Jason, and Apollonius, son of Alexander. The intergenerational link thus leads all the way from the time of Judas to the time of Hyrcanus, when the first book of Maccabees was written. It is in fact a much more stable succession narrative than the Hasmonean one. The Roman document, as cited in chapter 8, mentions no individual by name, but the accompanying letter presumably would have mentioned your delegates. If Judas went unmentioned, then the author of 1st Maccabees was wise not to cite it in full. But that his text still includes Eupolemus and Jason, albeit as agents of Judas, shows that these families could not be ignored even in Hyrcanus's time. And I wonder who would have claimed most of the credit in 161? The second book of Maccabees shows that the embassy could be discussed without any mention of Judas. None of this, of course, invalidates Eric's point, but I think we should add to it. The Asmoneans were not the only ones who claimed credit for maintaining Roman relations, and the precise constellation in which they did so is open to some debate. Given the lack of any mention of Judas in the Roman document, it is at least possible to read chapter 8 as a later attempt to turn a story that had so far been known as a story about Eupolemos and Jason into a story about Judas and his brothers. We can also ask who actually initiated the embassy to Rome in 161. Did Judas try to create an opportunity for local elites to use their skills and gain prestige within the framework he had to offer, thus binding them to his projected rule? Or did those families themselves push for such an opportunity? And Judas either agreed or, the more interesting option, did not have much of a say. We cannot know. I would actually hope that we don't know anything at all about Judas Maccabee. But Eric's choice to focus on the internal divisions of Maccabee and Judea opens up a whole range of interesting options to explore. And that, I would think, is the mark of a good paper. Thank you very much for your thoughtful um, comments here, Benedict. Well, that was actually a short paper in itself, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that uh, certainly Eric wants to respond uh, to your response first. Uh, and, for, um, and then we, we will, in our discussion later on, try to explore how much of agreement, contradiction or nuance is actually in, uh, in, in your comments. And uh, that is wonderful for the discussion that is expecting us all. But Eric, please go first. Well, I would uh, thank you, Benedict, for the, your very thoughtful comments and your uh, wise reading of my paper and response to it. Um, I'm not surprised at uh, the quality of the response. I was very pleased when I heard from uh, Altai and Ben that you were going to be the responder because like Altai, I'm a great uh, admirer of your work, as you know, and we have discussed it more than once. And uh, I have more than one, uh, at least on one occasion, written glowing reports of recommendation for you, and I meant every word of it. And now, as for the comments here, I th I'm pleased to know that you are in accord with my overall uh, understanding of Roman foreign policy and its attitudes towards the East, and that's the most important matter. Um, and in, in fact, you're very interesting, which I had not considered, and I was very pleased to see it, uh, your interesting um, notion that there were other parties who might claim credit for this treaty and might claim credit for uh, diplomatic uh, engagements and, in, and uh, involvement with Romans and elsewhere, other than the Maccabees, which in a way um, reinforces my notion that there was internal rivalry and the competition within Judea. So I, I welcome that addition, and I think it was a, it's, it's a very important one. Um, on some other matters, I'm not, uh, well, you know, dis agreements and disagreements is the nature of our profession. And were they not there, uh, we would, we'd be out of a job. So I welcome the disagreements as well as the agreements. Uh, I'm not persuaded that a treaty with Maranea, for example, on the Thracian coast was something that was a, that would have involved any expectation on either side, Romans or elsewhere, that there would be military intervention. Um, uh, 
Maranea and Inus, as you know, the two, two principal towns there of that Thr Thracian uh, region, had been sort of political footballs for years before. Uh, the, the Romans had removed them from the control of Philip V back in the uh, beginning of the century and then didn't care whether when Philip, in fact, uh, regained them. The Romans did not take any action on that score. They offered those towns to Attalus II um, in 170 or so, um, and, or no, after the war, after the war in 167, in the hopes, according to Polybius, that Attalus would take um, issue with his brother Eumenes II. This is a, a typical Polybian interpretation of Roman cynical maneuverings with foreign princes, and I doubt the validity of that uh, of that uh, episode, but even if it happened, um, the idea was that the Aenus uh, and Mar Maranea represented possible gains for Pergamum, Pahad re represented possible gains for Philip. The Roman involvement in them had been pretty minimal, and uh, they, in the end, liberated those cities. Uh, and the treaty with Maranea probably followed that. We don't know exactly when it happened. But the idea that it really represented that people would assume and they had the impression it would represent actual Roman involvement militarily in Maronea, I, I am not convinced of that. Now, the more important disagreement, um, which I would hope everybody would weigh in on in one fashion or another, is the idea that these that Roman these Roman treaties were more than symbols? They were actually understood as potential threats of Roman military intervention. Uh, I know that uh, Altai, for example, agrees with you on this, Benedict. So I have two formidable uh, opponents on the matter. I tremble with the uh, idea of confronting the two of you. Um, but I think the most important point that you make, Benedict, and I, I think it is an important point, is that even though we in our, uh, Olymp from our Olympian point of view, can recognize this larger Roman uh, reluctance to, enter to, to engage uh, militarily in the West, it might not have been obvious to people on the ground at the time. And I, if you make this point of what, what would be expected of people in 161 who did not have our um, broad understanding of Roman policy over decades and decades. And that's, I think, an important question to raise. What, how would people have seen this at the time? And well, what would they have known about Roman treaties? What would they have known about how Rome implemented its verbiage on these treaties. Well, I take, for example, a, a very interesting um, example here is the Roman treaty with the Achaean League, which took place, well, we don't know exactly when. We know that the Achaeans um, sided with Rome in the uh, Second Macedonian War against Philip V although they had previously had close connections with Macedon and they um, debated about this, but eventually went over to the side of Rome and fought with Rome against Philip. And the Achaeans at that point wanted a treaty with Rome. They had already um, agreed to fight on Rome's side, but they wanted a treaty. They asked for it on two or three different occasions in the 190s. Rome did not give them a treaty. Eventually they did get such a treaty, probably after the Peace of Apamea or sometime thereafter. Now, why did they want this treaty? What did they get out of it? What did they expect from it? Well, I think our best evidence on that is that when Rome actually did go to war against Perseus in 170, the Achaean, we're told by Polybius, who was present at this gathering, there was a meeting of Achaean leaders who discussed what should we do now that Rome has taken up arms against Perseus. 
Some people in the care said, let's be neutral. Let's not get involved one way or the other. Some said, oh, we really ought to go over to the Roman side. And others said, let's wait upon events. I'll do anything yet and see how things turn out. Then we'll make a decision. That's what Polybius tells us. And he was there at the meeting, as he said. What's interesting about that discussion is that the treaty with Rome was nowhere mentioned. There was no indication that there was a treaty. There was let alone any expectation that the treaty obliged the Romans or the Achaeans to go and uh, wage war on the side of the other. So that the treaty desperately wanted by the Achaeans and eventually achieved did have no obvious tangible functional uh, connection, but rather it symbolized the, uh, the uh, friendship and collaboration of Achaea in Rome, but nobody expected that that treaty in and of itself, since it was never mentioned in the circumstances, would oblige anybody to do anything. Now that's just one example, because it seems to me a very uh, blatant one, but there are numerous others. What would pe what, what people have thought in 161 about Roman actions? Well, the, as I've mentioned, they took no retaliation against the uh, Syrians for the death, uh, the murder of their own legate. That must have made an impression and an expectation that the Romans were not all that serious or they made up their own minds of the, for reasons that nobody else could really understand. One, uh, and, and I, I'm talking on much too long and I'll stay out of it from here on in. Um, but just one other example that um, we know the, the, the peace of Apamea that the Romans insisted of Antiochus III, who had just been defeated, that he uh, surrender his fleet and his elephants. Now, these elephants, however, were still there uh, when Octavius went to Syria and had to hamstring the elephants. And we also know that, uh, you know, the limitations on Syrian monarchy in the in the decades after the Peace of Apamea did not involve any Roman repression. We know that, Antioch, that after Antiochus IV left Egypt, he went and uh, held this elaborate festival at Daphne, which he displayed all of his armaments, all of the power of, and, and wealth of the Seleucid kingdom and the elephants who marched in there as well. In fact, even after the hamstring of the elephants by, uh, by uh, Octavius, they turn up, people forget this, they turn up in the war against uh, the Jews. There are, there are still Seleucid elephants operating there. So the actions of the Romans would have at best been puzzling to the, to the uh, peoples of the East. And there was certainly no obvious expectation and uh, anticipation that they would intervene militarily. So when you ask the, the very important question, what would they have thought in 161, uh, that would be my answer to it. And I'll withdraw from the fray for now. Benedict, you, you would have a chance to, to respond. Uh, if, I, I want, if you want, if you want. Uh, otherwise, I, I would open the floor. Yeah, I won't. I won't fight Eric on on, on Roman policy. I mean, I, I'm happy to 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 uh, debate properly debate Judean things, but I think I, I shouldn't fight him on Roman. I just note that, of course, you have not now in this discussion mentioned the day of Eloises, which was not very far away, and where the Romans did interfere, and people probably remember that. But uh, yeah, I I shall I shall withdraw as well. Um, okay, I already see some hands up, but for those of you who are not so familiar with Zoom, when you hover with your mouse or your cursor uh, rather um, at the, uh, over the lower field of uh, your Zoom frame, you will see a, um, a, um, a panel down there and you may see the smiley with the reactions. When you click that, you'll see the raise hand function. That's the easiest way to contribute. Um, if that should not be working for you or your connection is unstable, you can type your question or comment into the chat function uh, and Ben and I will be keeping an eye on this. Um, 
uh, be, before I uh, give Ori the word, I, I uh, would like to make one comment myself, not because I love harmony, um, but I do think there is actually a good way of, of pointing out um, that there is a lot that unites you or that there is a good compromise, not for the sake of compromise, I want to emphasize that. But um, I find uh, Eric's description of the situation in which the ambassadors were sent out very compelling, um, including the expectations and the need and the, the symbolic or political function that the treaty would have had in that situation. But at the same time, I'm also with Benedict saying we cannot exclude that no one thought that this might have further implications. And I would further add to it, the symbolic function might have been seen as compromised if people had understood from the beginning on that this is only symbolic and not binding in a potential case. Um, and yet we do see that this, well, uh, this, this case of alliance was never in vogue by the Judeans. What they did do though was sending ambassadors from time to time and asking for letters, which was of very high value. I think uh, each of us would agree that even the symbolic and political value of these letters were of high value. So that is uh, where I would position myself in between and really, um, well, I, I see so much more to agree than, than to disagree. Um, Ori, you come next and perhaps we, we do collect a couple of questions when they go into the same direction um, that might facilitate our discussion. And I, I would say with an eye on the clock, uh, we will probably go to one o'clock today so that we have up to half an hour for our discussion if Eric bears with us for so long. Um, or, Ori, please. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I've been a student of Eric's for 25 years now, and I think that this is the first time that I'm hearing or reading him and I'm in full agreement. So uh, that's a shocker, uh, <laughs> but, but I am. But so I just want to offer a couple of remarks, one from the Jewish Judean side and one from the Roman side. Um, and from the Judean side, um, I think you are very right to emphasize the, the uh, fragmented state of Judean society at this point. I think since the, um, say, fifth Syrian war, we have about 40 years of, of, of everything that, of, of the entire structure of government and maybe society uh, moving about and then crumbling. We have a change of dynasty. Everything is in shambles. And... I think that um, just going after Rome and and winning the approval of Rome is a major achievement for everybody. And the letters that start um, um, making their way about, I mean, even vis-a-vis -vis the Seleucids or internal oppositions or uh, Levantine cities, the mere fact that Judas Maccabee is the one who, with whom these foreign powers are speaking, that alone is, I think, uh, very significant. And also, uh, Benedict, I, I, I think, I didn't think about that before, but I think we should also take to heart what you're saying, is that what we have here is the words of 1st Maccabee. And when when 1st Maccabee says that Judas elected or selected um, these two messengers, uh, this is this is the report of a 60 years, roughly 60 years later. And we, we don't really know what was going on on the ground or what kind of coalitions or agreements or we have no access to, to the actual thing. But I think that it's significant, um, even if we look in uh, First Maccabees uh, uh, 14, that's Simon's charter, right? That the, the very last reason that the author gives for why local Judeans agree to give Simon uh, this charter, the last item on the list is, is the shield that, that is um, um, received from Rome and Roman relations, that's, that's like the, um, biggest reason why. So this is on the Judean side and on the Roman side. Um, Eric, you spoke a lot about the Roman embassies, but in this case, I think it's the other way around. It's these two, it's Jason and Opolemos going on a trip to Rome. And, and I think we would all 
really love to know what they were up to there. How, how did they get their audience at the Senate? Who were they talking to? There must have been a process. And if we ask Cui Bono, maybe we should imagine um, an active group of Roman elite senators, maybe more than senators, who are looking for opportunities. And you know, somebody makes this connection and they now have these two Judeans to bring to the Senate and maybe further their own policy, become more important. In a way, in, in looking at uh, Roman imperialism, that would be a uh, kind of compromise between what you said many years ago and what Harris said many years ago. Uh, for once, these things, I think, go together. Thank you, that would be my remark. I'll tell you, you need to unmute yourself. Dear me, nobody heard me for this? Uh, no, 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 we, we heard you well. It was only my, my mistake. Ah. I had unmuted myself. I was just going to say um, that uh, you have said, uh, addressed so many points. It would be complicating matters if we added other comments right now. Um, so it would be a good time for Eric to, to respond to your points. Well, I think, as always, Ori makes a very good point. And um, I, the idea of what uh, Jewish envoys would expect once they arrived in Rome is a in very interesting question. We do know of numerous, numerous other delegations from other peoples all over the Eastern world that would come to Rome with regularity, often several times a year uh, for different embassies. So, um, and in some cases, it may well be that they had prior connections with individual Roman senators who could introduce them. We do know on a couple of occasions this did happen that senator, an individual Roman senator would introduce the um, envoy of a foreign city or a foreign king uh, into the Senate. That's not the same thing as having a group of senators who were experts in these areas who were long um, schooled and experienced in understanding the peoples of these, to many Romans, rather remote nations. So the formalities of an introduction of a, of a, of a legate into the Roman Senate is a different matter from actually calling upon a segment of the Roman um, senatorial class who have expert expertise in Pergamum or Syria or uh, Judea. Thank you. Then um, Gregor, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have to apologize if there are some disturbing noises or strange noise in the background. This, these are my two sons who are already a bit tired. It's nearly half past six, uh, six here in Austria. Um, and uh, please also uh, apologize for my uh, not quite correct English, um, because of the pandemic, I lack a bit of practice. So um, one comment at the beginning, I never expected that I would be in the situation to uh, listen to a lecture of uh, Professor Kroon uh, in person um, when I started reading his monographs. And uh, I want to thank for the possibility uh, due to the pandemic and uh, the modern tools that uh, this is this was is possible. So I have um, two uh, questions, Professor Kuhn. Um, Konstantin, can you please bitte wieder einschalten? I'm sorry. Uh, so um, you uh, you mentioned um, the number of legates um, or the relative number of legates. Uh, being on embassies or on delegations more than once or even more than twice. Um, and I wanted to ask if you believe that the number of known legates, so this are around 120, um, is uh, large enough to make uh, such quantitative analysis um, regarding the fact that we have many embassies where we only know one member, but we know that uh, uh, by name, but um, we know that there must have been more than the one member, Poly Polybius or Olivius mentions. And um, the second question ties uh, into 
that also. So um, uh, it's about a quarter of the known legates who are um, on uh, embassy uh, more than once. Uh, which now, uh, concerning the period between the Second Punic War and the um, destruction of uh, Corinth or Carthago. And I wanted to ask which relative number you uh, would expect to um, uh, to yeah to make the conclusion that the Romans um, built something up which would be nowadays something like a diplomatic core. So I hope my questions were understandable and uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, your questions are fully understandable and I appreciate them and thank you for them because they are good questions and worth considering. Yes, we do not know the names of all the members of all the delegations by a long shot. We usually do know at least the, the, uh, the person who was most prominent or who was the head of the legation. Um, and in those cases, even those that were most prominent, like for example, Tiberius Gracchus, the father of the Gracchi, who met, uh, or the famous um, long, uh, uh, embassy took a very long time with Scipio Aemilianus later on, um, we know the, the heads of the delegate, and we know that in the, those cases, they almost never went again. And if that's true of the head of the legation, I would think that ipso facto, it would also be true of the others whose names we do not always know. Uh, there are countless numbers who must have gone, who, whose names have not um, appeared in our sources. But if the heads of the legations who were the most uh, influential theoretically and whose comments when they came back to the Senate about their recommendations were for the most part either ignored or rejected. That to my mind is a telling um, piece of evidence that should hold for the others as well. Uh, and as I said, if you're gonna have we don't know the numbers on, in any one legation, but if you're going to have a few people on every legation, you will run out of senators to send. And so occasionally you will have to send somebody on a second or even a third. But the failure of um, any consistent uh, repeat performances by the heads of the legations is to my mind a very telling case. And the and maybe even more, I didn't stress this as much as perhaps I would have, but didn't have that much time. Um, the number of times when these, when the recommendations and the reports of the embassies came back in which the Senate did not go by their recommendations is a quite um, telling uh, piece of evidence, I think, for this unwillingness of the corporate body of the Senate to be dependent upon a segment of their, of their body uh, as determining or as be having a uh, major voice in the decisions. But I thank you very much for bringing up the fact that, we, that there are a lot of names that we simply do not know. You're quite right and that should be taken into account. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for this. And before I call on Anne, I uh, want to mention one um, comment from the chat box, um, which is adding to, uh, to Benedict's um, indication that we should also consider a more thriving community or groupings of uh, potential ambassadors in Judean society. And the example uh, given here is the, the multiple or the rival delegation sent to Pompeii, which of course Benedict is very well aware of. He published an article uh, about it many years ago, but uh, this is uh, certainly uh, an interesting addition to, uh, to it. Um, though when it comes to uh, the family of Eupolemus and, uh, and John, I, I actually see a consistency that these people turn uh, well show up 
in the Maccabean context so that we can actually assume that there was a, a close relationship. But uh, this does not detract at all from Benedict's comment that uh, they had their own glory to, to gain by doing this. So they were uh, concerned about their own profile as potentially uh, as also for their ruler that they were supporting. Um, so that was basically only a comment uh, so that Anne has the next word. Uh, well, Eric, thank you for this. You know, you, you know I'm often thinking about different parts of the Mediterranean when they run into um, Romans, um, how people try to make sense of these multi-person Roman legations is actually really interesting. Um, you know, we were talking a couple months ago about uh, the monument at Olympia to the collective of the collective delegation of Mamias. Um, and my Judea really sort of picks up later um, with Herod, but, but, but listening to this is very important, listening to all of you. And I think one of the things we have little access to, but matters, is how do these people think the other one works, okay? I mean, I've just been reading Philo saying, thank God they got rid of all the, you know, this senatorial crap and we have one person to talk to instead of dealing with these people who change their minds all the time, right? Philo's apology for the, for the Roman autocracy, where you have both a collective, the Senate, um, but it's highly granular, always internally shifting. I mean, it's right to say they had to get someone to, you know, allow them to cross the Pomerium and bring them in. How do you begin to spot someone just to talk to? And on the other side, what do Romans think Judeans are anyway? Do they understand that there's a preeminent leader? What do they think Judah Maccabee is? What do they, either, are, do they understand themselves to be talking about something, talking to people who are what we would call an oligarchy of some kind when they meet these other aristocrats, for, for lack of a better word for them? Um, and I would just say from the point of view of how people hold power, that yes, it's very interesting to know we even have evidence that when you hear a name, which you're always really hearing is a coalition, you, you, you cannot hold power. Right? even if you're Augustus, without other people in some way saying, I will work with you, which doesn't mean that they're your, your, your agents. So what we've got are entities that on the one hand look like collectives, but within the collective, individuals are pushing and shifting. Um, and how much do they grasp that about each other would be sort of my uh, great question. I, I think I know how Adelids understand Rome to work, but I don't know what um, the legates of Judea um, think Rome is, and vice versa. What do the Romans think Judeans are? So over to all the rest of you. Eric, please. <laughs> well, uh, I would just say that um, whoever the representatives were on this mission, um, they are not named in the, in the text of the treaty. The text of the treaty was between Rome and ta ethnos eudaion, which was the proper way of doing it. They were simply on an official basis, on a formal basis, dealing with the people of the Jews. These representatives were, uh, I'm sure that the Romans, if Benedict is right, that there is a kind of uh, competition among uh, the Jews who were going there, I don't think that the Romans knew or cared very much about it. If they were going to make a treaty, it was with, it was with Tal Ethnos Judaeo. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Mattia Knez. Hopefully I've pronounced it correctly. I read it out. Why was there no extreme reaction to the murder of a high-ranking Roman dignitary by a foreign power? Such an action in the modern day would invite a major diplomatic incident. Was the legate at odds with some Senate members? Well, uh, as I tried to stress, this was a remarkable occasion and I think a very telling and revealing one. Uh, it's 
more than possible that uh, Octavius had enemies in uh, in the Senate, that almost every senator had enemies in that body. Um, but the fact that the Senate as a whole simply ignored the murder is to me the most important element. And whatever the motives of individual senators who may have taken that uh, position, the official, the unwillingness to express any uh, desire for retaliation, indeed quite the contrary, it does to me um, speak to a very deep-seated desire on the part of the collectivity not to get involved in the East any more than they absolutely have to, that there are, we often, in talking about Roman relations with the Hellenistic world, forget that the Romans had lots going on in the West as well, in Spain and Gaul, if not to mention uh, Carthage, uh, that this was not the, f the, the uh, uh, individual battles and rivalries in the East uh, was not the, top, uh, not the top item on the Roman agenda at any time. Thank you. I, yeah, I think that is a very strong answer. And I repeat the other answer that you have given in your uh, own presentation, which I also find very compelling, namely that I think many senators were disgusted by what Octavius had done. That does not seem, to, well, I, I put it in my words, which are a little stronger here, but uh, uh, it's hard to imagine that he had a mandate for doing what he did. Though you also made it clear, Eric, that there were often no clear mandates. There was a lot of leeway, um, and I fully agree with that, but this Octavius went beyond what uh, a, a normal Roman or a decent person under uh, in, uh, the, in the ancient context, uh, Greece and Rome would have done. So they were not overly sympathetic. Uh, but again, when we look at the response that the Roman Senate then gave to Leptinus, they didn't take him, so they left it basically open and in limbo. And that is yet another, I would say, potential key to take potentially action in the future. And uh, more specifically to one point in Matthias question was uh, that, uh, well, uh, Matthias, you formulated the question uh, that the murder was done by a foreign power. Um, here, I think it is possible to see, uh, to modify or, or to, to admit that the Romans acknowledged that it was not the king, that it was an individual that acted. Of course, the Romans were free to, to construe the situation as they wanted as, and as a, a, it might have served them. If they wanted to go to war, they could have said, well, it were the, the Seleucid uh, royal court or the king himself who has to bear responsibility. But as Eric also explained quite compellingly, they did not have a real interest to do that. So they were able to say that this was an individual who had committed this potential crime or not, and just left it in limbo. Um, and uh, so it is different, I think, from a situation where a representative of a state has a clear mandate and then is becomes the victim of the other power. So do I see, I, right now I'm not seeing further questions or comments. Ben, ben has sure that, yes, can, can I, Altai? Uh, so um, given, given everything we've said, is there still not a pattern of what we could call low cost intimidation Right, I'm thinking about a certain dictator right now who sometimes does low cost manipulation. Okay, and I would put a few things into it. You send one legate, right, to the shores of Egypt and it intimidates Antiochus IV so much that he leaves from a successful invasion. He, he took that intimidation very seriously. Um, and yet, you, you know, you talked about no cost or little cost. I think that's exactly right. The Romans sent one ship and he leaves. But was he not intimidated? Um, uh, taking uh, the hostage exchange of Antiochus and Demetrius, is, is, that, is there no intimidation in there? And even in the incident that we're talking about, uh, 
uh, with the, the hamstringing of the elephants, that still was an attempt at, at, at intimidation. So, um, and so I would suggest that put those three things together with this treat, with this treaty or this, this letter, and these can all be with little effort, with little cost, an effort to intimidate the Saluki. Okay, I think uh, you make some valid points there, Ben, not surprisingly. Um, the day of Eleusis, which I did actually allude to in the talk, but didn't want to dwell on, it's been written about many, many times, in which Popilius Linus uh, asked, not very politely, for Antiochus IV to withdraw from Egypt, and when he didn't immediately do so, uh, Linus drew a circle in the sand around him and said, well, you have plenty of time to give me the answer, just tell me before you step out of the circle. That was intimidation, no question about it. But, remember the circumstances. This is right after the news of the Battle of Pydna had occurred. Papilius Linus had been traveling about or, or waiting upon events for some months before then. He did not go to, uh, uh, to Egypt, to Eleusis, until the Battle of Pydna was over and it was clear that the war was over. The Romans had conquered, they were in complete command. This was the time when Linus was able to exercise this kind of bluster and bullying. And yes, under those circumstances, if I were Antiochus IV, I would have withdrawn too. I would not want to cross the Romans when they had just defeated the uh, greatest power of the Eastern Mediterranean. But how long did this intimidation last and what effect did it have? We shouldn't forget that even after this drawing of the circle and Antiochus' agreement to withdraw, there was a friendly interchange between Linus and Antiochus. They shook hands, they greeted one another happily. We're all uh, good friends now. There was not a, uh, uh, it was not the point, the point was not that this was a, uh, this had intimidated Antiochus into halting any other plans of his. And it's no coincidence that not long thereafter, um, he conducted this festival at Daphne in which he displayed to all uh, who might have been aware of it, the vast array of wealth, power, military lines, elephants, etc. And the Romans didn't care anymore. So long as he was not causing problems in Egypt, he could do what he wished and he did do pretty much what he wished. So this intimidation was of short duration, I would say, and not intended to halt um, the advance of the Seleucids elsewhere. Um, now, Ben, forgive me, but can you tell me the other episodes that you had mentioned? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to string together the letter we're talking about, the incident with hamstringing the elephants, um, the hostage exchange of, of, take, of sending Antiochus IV back, which I have my own theories about, and, and taking Demetrius. Are these not all efforts at intimidation? So, in, and so you're, um, even if it's a momentary mm -hmm. attempt to intimidate, even if looking back, we can say they were not intimidated for long, don't we have, again, it didn't, it's, you, you said the word cost. I thought that was a very important word. It didn't cost them much. You send one ship, you send three legates, you write a letter. It really, you know, um, I, I know somebody on the National Security Council says that's a buck and a half, right? You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost us anything. And, and like you say, it makes us look good. But is there not a pattern of intimidation nevertheless, or an attempt to uh, intimidate? Well, all I can say is that if it was an attempt to intimidate, the intimidation was, uh, did not have any long-term effects, not just with the withdrawal of Antiochus from Egypt, but the hostage, now the Romans took hostages with regularity. This was not a, a special um, act in uh, opposition or in intimidation of the Seleucids. 
And the um, very often, I think, when they took hostages, it, and they did in these cases, particular cases of Demetrius and of Antiochus uh, before him, basically to cool down the uh, internal rivalries in Syria by removing one of the possible sources of friction and a, a, a prince of the royal house who could draw um, supporters and, uh, and friends to him, by removing them, it, would, it made a, for a more stable situation after the Peace of Apamea. And then again, uh, of course, they wanted to keep Demetrius in Rome, but when he managed to escape anyway, they did not retaliate against him. They did not then uh, say, well, my, you didn't uh, adhere to our intimidation and so we'll punish you. Uh, and I, I agree with you entirely that, the, uh, that the, this cost the Romans nothing. It cost them nothing in terms of material uh, matters. It cost them nothing, I think, in terms of their overall um, aura and image in the Mediterranean to have a hostage and to have and on occasion to send a letter. Yes, this letter, I, I assume you're referring to the letter that they sent at the, uh, that is recorded by First Maccabees after he records the treaty of this letter, right. intimidating letter to Demetrius. It obviously didn't have any effect. Demetrius went on and attacked the Jews almost immediately thereafter and the Romans didn't do anything. And I think he knew that that was the case. So this, so I return again and again to the symbolism and the imagery rather than the uh, just, just one more second and I'll be quiet. But I, I think that you, the resources to invade Egypt were a very big deal. And as uh, somebody, Benedict or somebody put in the chat, it's remembered in the book of Daniel. But you yourself, Eric, were the one, I mean, this is what you taught me. That day of Lucifer was such a big deal, right, that he came in a wrath. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, so and you say, well, they were shaking hands afterwards, but that's a huge deal. The resources to invade Egypt. He was successful. He conquered all, if I remember correctly, except for Alexandria. And he was at the gates right to leave there. I mean, that's a lot of intimidation and success, successful intimidation. It's intimidation by Antiochus of the Egyptians. No, of the, I'm sorry, the Romans on, on, on Antiochus that he left. I mean, somebody in the chat is saying, well, he did him a favor, but that was his second invasion, right? Um, I, I mean, he, he, I thought, I think he wanted to conquer the world and Egypt was the next step. And he had a steps planned after that, like his father. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's a, a very good point. Um, he certainly, he was on the brink actually of bringing Egypt to its knees. There's no doubt about it. And obviously he, he was deeply uh, embarrassed at the very least to have to leave that uh, venture. And he, as, as I've said in, in, in the uh, article that you mentioned, one of the outcomes of that was he was now going to vent his rage on Judea, right. which he did without any, the Romans had no interest in any further intimidation or any further control. So long as he stayed out of Egypt, they didn't care what he did. And he was able to display his power. He was also able to invade, not only in Judea, but then when that didn't work out quite as he hoped, he went on further into the East. Um, now it so happened that he died at that point, but had he gone on and, and, and uh, sort of reproduced the Anabasis of Antiochus III, the Romans wouldn't have cared. Thank you so much to everyone, but most of all to you, Eric. Two full hours have passed, and uh, I think you have inspired and informed us uh, quite a bit. And many questions uh, and comments are certainly still on, your, uh, on our minds, but that is a sign of a very, very good talk. And, and I do see that the discussion, well, the long-term discussion over the decades has clearly moved into uh, more political interpretations, and you have made the greatest contributions to that, not to be entangled in, uh, in legalistic questions. And uh, there are ever more things to explore as became clear um, um, by, well, your emphasis on how this treaty might be perceived on different Judean groups uh, by different Roman 
agents, and as uh, as Anne uh, has made quite clear also with her with her question or comment, how would each other player in the Mediterranean world would actually perceive this? And I think that will be a subject or a topic in the future to be explored further. How well how treaties, how political interactions might have been. Uh, might have been perceived in a world that was only slowly becoming monopolar, and uh, but in reality, the realities on the ground were still very much heterogeneous for for a much longer time. So, thank you very much again to uh, to you, Eric, to you, Benedict, and to everyone, um, especially also to my friend and colleague uh, Rabbi Ben Skolnick. I do not want to end without announcing that we are going to have two further lectures upcoming in our winter series. The next is by, um, by Dr. Nicholas Secunda from Dance University, the over next uh, by Dr. John Serrati from uh, McGill University. And um, both of them will actually talk on military matters and military colonies in the Seleucid Kingdom the first on March the 16th, the second on uh, April the 20th. So keep the Seleucid Wednesday marked in your calendars and we look very much forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. That was great. Thank you. Thanks. Eric, thank you so much. That was